Welcome to this week's episode of Being Human. Uh, delighted to say I'm here with uh, Mika Bartel. She's uh, the Professor of Genetics and Wellbeing at the Vrij Universiteit or VU Amsterdam, uh, and also the President of the International Positive Psychology Association. Uh, Mika, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's awesome to have you here. And uh, for those listening, we should say that uh, you have a, um, a smiley face, soccer ball just behind your head, which, uh, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> which uh, is setting the third beautifully. Um, okay, so we were just saying before we came on, um, th- th- this question of like definition or uh, w- what do we mean? So maybe we should start there before we start exploring the topic is, the, you know, how do we define well-being? And also a question I had as, as we came into this was, why that term well-being we might use synonyms like happiness or another another term like yeah be interested in in why that term and then how do we define it yeah well that that's we could talk for hours about this but uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's more to talk about but uh in in general uh in in our line of research uh we actually use the definition that people feel well and that they function well uh, and so there's a, a large chunk is subjective because how you feel is a subjective assessment. Um, but people are uh, uh, quite able to to assess their how they feel uh, and how they function in the situation where they are and where they want to be. Um, I often use the term well-being as more as an umbrella term for the more specific uh, concept like happiness, satisfaction with life, quality of life. And now even extended to meaning in life and purpose. So the hedonic part, the eudaimonic part. Um, I like the term well-being because it's an umbrella term. And we also showed with uh, large data sets that in the end, it doesn't really matter uh, if you ask about if someone feels happy or satisfied with his life. The one is more a momentary assessment. The other is more like a cognitive appraisal of life but in the end if you have large data sets and assess all these things in human beings you see very strong associations between the different measures right and you, you slipped in a couple of terms there that i'm not sure everyone will be familiar with so yeah. you, um hedonic versus you do yeah you yeah, don't yeah well that is actually that that goes back to the uh, old philosophers that that made this separation hedonic is more the the pleasure and pain part so the happiness the satisfaction but also maybe the bit of the negative side uh, depressive symptoms the eudaimonic part is more that you want to live a a meaningful life and that you want to live your life uh, with a certain purpose Um, and those are related uh, and and we are trying to understand if there's some kind of direction but we're not there yet but it's it's all on the positive side of feelings of humans right and, and as you said, you use then this term well-being as an umbrella for that kind of cluster yeah. of what, what yeah, and I think it's important states that of being. Actually, yeah, the field, the field actually made a, made a mess it itself. So it's a relatively young research field, but everybody's using all the terms interchangeably. That doesn't make it easier. So I always uh, ask people to, to clarify how they did assess it, what kind of survey did they use, or what kind of questions did they ask. Um, but, right. uh, and then, and then your your professorship is genetics and well being. So that yes, yeah. So so what? So I guess what exactly then are you looking at in terms of the relationship between the two? Yeah. Well, I I've, uh, always have been obsessed by differences between people uh, my whole life, uh, and I, I also obsessed with biology and that particular combination. Why are people different, and what is genes doing, and what's the environment doing? Um, and I do exactly the same for, for well-being. So why are some people happier than other people in similar circumstances? Or why are some environmental uh, exposures or circumstances harder to some people than to others? Uh, and that all uh, well is, can be boiled down to an interplay of genes and environment. So we try to understand the heritability. We already did. That's, that's quite a robust estimate. But we also try to find the genetic locations on the okay. human genome. And the interplay with the environment, right? And and okay, so what, that's interesting. So, what is the heritability? What what have you found there? Yeah, we found that uh, about in in like the data sets we use. So that's all uh, Western rich country data sets. 
uh, we see that about 40% of the differences in well-being between people is accounted for by genetic differences between people. And the remaining differences that you see is accounted for by environmental differences. Right. And within that 40%, is it, are, are certain aspects of well-being more hereditable than others? Or is it... No, not really. Same? No. Uh, okay. You see a bit of variation, but that could be due to, to sampling things. And uh, so it's the, the mm. 40% is relatively robust. It's important to mention that it's a relative balance between genes and environments. So if you have data sets in other countries that have uh, more variety in the environment, for example, it could be the case that the environment becomes more important and the genes are suppressed by the environment, for example. But mm. uh, currently, uh, most large data sets, as for every a topic that you study in humans, is available in not all countries around the world, unfortunately. Right, right. Well, just immediately, as I, as I react to that, it, it's sort of fascinating to think that the extent to which I'm purpose-driven or not in life is, is 40% down to my genes. That's, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I know that's important to realize that it's about the differences between people. So I'm, I, if you, you can't translate the heritability to an individual, right. but you can, if you just observe your own family and peer group, you can see that there are differences. Some people are more easy, happy than other people. And some people are very happy while they have a miserable life and other people are not happy while you think, well, you got it all. Why are you not happy? And, and, and actually, when you don't understand the, the why defined by the environment, you can see the genetic differences between people. Same for optimism. Some people always see the glass half full, while others always see the glass half empty. Uh, and and that, that is the genotype that actually causes these differences between people. Right. But yeah, you've, but that's interesting. You've also just exposed that a sort of a failing in my logic there. So it's not that I personally have 40% no, of my behaviors determined by my genes. It means across no. the population. It's across the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. So, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. so some but, people have a, have a better genetic package for happiness, while others have a worse genetic package. But we, we are currently not at the state of, uh, of uh, development and research and outcomes that we can quantify this specifically for everybody in a reliable way. We are able to do so, but it's not reliable uh, yet. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just just that point about you can you can see it in families. I mean, just I've got two, I've got twin boys. They're non-identical, right? But they're, <laughs> um, but he, he, I mean, maybe that's important. That, but they, yeah, w one of them seems to have a much easier ride through life than the other. Yeah, well, that, that's and they have the, the same example. parents, obviously, and that, that, yeah, always everything is the same. Their uh, environment is, 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 is very similar, uh, but their, yeah. uh, their genes are not, and uh, that, that makes a difference. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, so so what, what are we learning then in terms of the extent to which our well-being is environmental? Have you started to uncover like particular factors that have a stronger effect than others in people's environment? Yeah, you see uh, what you see, uh, what we did, that, that's easy to explain the study. We took uh, satisfaction with life assessments in a very large group of uh, Dutch adults. And, and we combined that with everything that was known about the environment based on their postal code. So it's things like air pollution, noise pollution, but also how many shops are there, how many exercise possibilities, uh, well, uh, socioeconomic status of neighborhoods, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and when we looked, and there is a lot of studies that look at one particular th thing. So some studies look at green space and well-being or living in the countryside and well-being, but then you miss out on all the other aspects. So we, we took them all and we put them in a box. And, uh, and, and actually the one thing that came out after correction for all kinds of socioeconomic status factors was safety. So the safety of the environment, regardless of the socioeconomic status of the environment, is an important factor for human well-being. So that is, I think, from a policy perspective, a very important uh, finding. Uh, and is that for, safety, or maybe it's the same thing, but in absolute terms or, or, or somehow perception of safety? Like, yeah, what, what do you mean by safety? I guess. Yeah, it was in this case, it was a combined assessment uh, of uh, objective measures like crime rates uh, with subjective experience of safety. Mm. Um, and that's also, uh, uh, again, uh, the complex factor that 
safety means something different to pe- some people than to other people. Um, so some people will, if you look, you walk in the same street, some people will feel safe while others don't. So mm. although it's a nice outcome for policy, it's also difficult, but it's a, a, an aspect that you could take into account when you talk to people in certain neighborhoods. And if you want change, you, you have to assess their feelings of safety and what they consider to be safe. Uh, and then you will get different answers and you have to, of course, find the optimal solution. Uh, but I think the most important message from any study that looks at genes and environment is that large parts of difference between people are based on genetic differences. Uh, so they are there. Uh, and you can't ignore it. And you have to embrace it and have to try to work with it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And... Uh... And I guess, I guess that can be difficult for some people, for people who want to feel like they can make it all better, right? True, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and create and, utopias. And, yeah, and, it, and the important part is that trying to make it better starts by asking people how they feel, what they're, what's important to them. And that's something we, we, we do a lot of things top down. Uh, we think, well, it's good mm. to have more biking paths in a city. Well, start asking people if they actually want more biking paths or maybe something else. Yeah. Um, so don't expect that someone else is thinks in the same way as you do and appreciates the same things. Right. Um, but it, it sounds to me like one of the important aspects it's worthwhile to ask based on your research is it like how people's experience of safety. Yeah. If yeah. you're looking to improve well-being. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and in many cases, that, that is relatively easy because, in general, dark areas are perceived as unsafe to most of us. Uh, so it's not that it's like that everybody's completely different. Right, right. Uh, and, 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 yeah, breaking down safety a little bit. So darkness, is there, are there other things you've found that pertain to people's perception of safety? No, but we, we didn't dive into it that much that we now have. Uh, more details on this finding now. Mm. Um, so safety is one. Uh, is there anything else that's come to light in terms of uh, well, an, an interesting factors? one is that that always comes out of uh, research is social connection. But the fascinating thing is, so that there is a an, an, an positive association between your uh, uh, social connection and your well-being. So the better your social connection. Uh, higher your score on well-being survey. Uh, but we tried to understand what the background of this association was, and we found out that it's mainly driven by uh, a genetic factor. So people, actually, if, the, if you have the social connections that you like, you feel better. But it's not that everybody needs to have the same social connections. Uh, so mm. some people feel connected to people if they have one best friend that they see once a week. Other people feel socially connected if they have 40 friends that they see every month. Someone else feels connected if he has 10 friends and sees them every day. So uh, the, the variation, again, is important, but it's important that you feel connected to at least someone uh, in the world. Yeah. And most people do, luckily, so, uh, but I mean, not what's, everybody. <laughs> what's fascinating is the recursive nature of this, right? Like, even if you isolate something that's a, it's a environmental factor, like say social connection. <laughs> like even yeah. that. Well, there's, ex- there's difference ex- by genetics. Yeah. I don't think there's any en- environmental factor, what we call environmental factor, that does not have a genetic component. Right. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. So teasing all this apart. Yeah. Got highly complex. True, but highly fascinating. Yeah. Super yeah. complexity. Yeah. Yeah. So. So depending on the individual and their genetic makeup, yeah, their, their experience of social connection will differ, and then what they need in order to support their well-being would be would be different. Yeah, but it, so it's it's actually uh, a good aim would to to be to help people to sort out what their favorite social connection is. So most of the things are like uh, dictated by society or dictated by expectations. Uh, and I think people will become happier if they try to understand what their own well-being is in, in relation to the society. So the society is a one-fits-all 
approach. And uh, we should get rid of that one fits size fits all and, and be more personalized. Yeah, and I can see how this would impact because because a lot of the you know this podcast is you know a lot of, we've got a lot of business listeners right or, or, and and they're thinking about this in the organizational context and I'm just thinking about surveying for example like let's just take that example if you were coming at this more top down and you were trying to understand people's level of social connection and you had a preconceived idea that let's say it's founded on like how many friends do you feel you have at work right like in that yeah. kind of uninformed in in an uninformed approach you might ask people how many friends you have at work and then like take the average and that be your indicated of how socially connected people feel. Whereas given what you said, it's much more important to ask people well, how socially connected you usually feel or at least a, a version of that question sure. that would make sense. To yeah. Yeah. And for example, what, 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 what often happens is, okay, we want to increase social connections. Let's create a one week lunch for everybody. Mm. But some people hate lunches with colleagues <laughs> or hate lunches with more than four people. So you make also people unhappy. Some people will like it, but some people will not like it. And and so that is by first asking people what what for you would be a change we can make that would make you happier in the workplace. That's where it starts. And then you get a mm. long list. And you and of course, in the ideal world, you could do everything on the list. That's not reality, but you can still think, okay, sometimes it's sometimes it's very easy fixes uh that you don't think of, like uh placing desk in a different corner or more or less desks in one area or this lunch or not this lunch or all these kinds of tiny things that could help. Uh, but don't expect a one size fits all change to make everybody happier. Right. And how reliable is the self-reporting? Like how, uh, you know, in general, how, how well do people know the answer to that question? Right. Yeah. Well, the, the people uh, know very well how they feel. So if right. you ask them about their, if you say, for example, could you, it, could you rate your life on a scale from zero to 10? Uh, you can do that in, in the same individual several times, but you could also do that in identical twins, for example, and you will get a reliable answer, as reliable as anything else you ask from a human being. Um, and there's no other way because you, people always ask, do you have an objective measure or do you have a brain measure? But uh, for brain, it's way too complex. And for object objective, it's impossible because it's a just subjective feeling. And that's mm. the same with, with stress. There are, there are various ways of assessing stress. You can ask people, are you stressed? You can assess their cortisol, so the function of their HPA axis. The correlation between these two is, is more or less absent. So people can, be, can feel stressed but don't have a physiological reaction or people can have a physiological reaction and don't feel the stress. What's important, I think, is what you feel. So what you report. And on the long term, you shouldn't have the high arousal constantly because that's, for, from a physiological perspective, not the best way of surviving your body. But on the, on the shorter term, how you feel is more important. Right. Right. Um, that's interesting, yeah, because... So, so a lot of these, because you do see that as a, as a kind of a trend to towards wearables, right? And and sure. yeah. do you, do you and and people sort of, I guess, monitoring their own physiology. Does does that play a role here? What, what's your view on that? Well, I think some people are very sensitive. So if they have like a step counter and they get feedback, and and your watch says, "Come on, you have to walk more," they do. But other people are completely insensitive to these uh, these cues so that, that that's a personal thing i think it's i love data so <laughs> anything you can measure is i think nice um and it's it's good to we also do studies with mobile phones and uh, assess like eight times a day how happy are you mm. on the longer run when we give back the reports to people, people like to see their fluctuation they like to see that they are in generally happier when they're at home than when they're at work so it could give you information about yourself. So in that sense, it's good. Um, but you can't draw very big conclusions because life is too complex to say, okay, I do an assessment of a week, eight times a day, and I know your complete well-being profile for the rest of your life because life right. changes, uh, season mm. changes, week changes, uh, yeah. unexpected events happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the so safety, social connection, um, I'm guessing like, Physical fitness is on the list. Is that is that right? Uh, th th there is an association, of course, but the complexity for most associations is that we don't have the direction of causation. 
so uh, there is a there is a there is a link between uh, health, somatic health, and mental health. Uh, but do you feel better? Are you happier because you are healthy, or are you healthier because you're happier? Because when you're happier, your your level of self control is generally a bit higher. You're better able to eat healthy exercise at the expected amount uh, and and all that kind of stuff so it, it's it's more like a, a spiral and we don't know where it starts but that doesn't really matter because you can intervene on both you can either say okay let's try to exercise more or let's try to increase your feelings of happiness by a positive psychology intervention so although it's interesting to learn more about the direction of causation it's not essential uh, to use it as prevention or intervention Right, right, um, and I kind of, I kind of jumped in there. But what if, if safety and social connection are, are, are important ones? What, what else is from your research is important? That's that's very difficult. We we didn't, uh, we weren't able so far to specify more things because it's uh, individual specific. Right, um, and and so uh, we we did one funny study in the past where we uh, asked the identical twins. So they're genetically identical. They're each other's clones. And they were uh, 14 years old, so adolescents. And they had a very different score on our well-being surveys. We call them discord. And one score is very high, one score is very low. And thought, well, this is interesting. The, the genes can't be to make the difference, so it should be environment. So let's interview them. So we interviewed about 25 pairs. Because it's due to the heritable component, the, the, the big difference is rare. Uh, and then it, there was actually nothing constant in their answer. It was, oh, yeah, but I just had a very bad grade at school or I had a fight with my friend or it was just, yeah, or I, well, my brother ate all the cookies and I hate him. And all, all this kind of like daily hassles came out of the interviews, but nothing big. And and actually, uh, Professor Ken Kentler did the same thing for depression at some point in, in the United States. And also of course it's it's there it's built up of negative things but it was also like very tiny life factors what we call tiny but could be have big effect on people uh, at the moment they fill out the survey for example or when they are when it's a constant tiny effect it can still build up to be a big problem um, so it's hard to to really identify factors that make everybody happy the important thing right. is to understand what factors make you happy Right, right. So it's yeah, idios, idiosyncratic based on the individual, and I guess that's a message people don't want to hear, right? They just want to hear like, tell me like the three True. things I can do in my family yeah. or my school or my company no, or my yeah. society. Well, there are things that you can do. So there, there are a couple of interventions that you can do. So uh, a simple one, but but an effective one for for a substantial amount of people is count your blessings. We live in a very fast life. We accept everything that happens. And, but if you if you try to take a step back and take the moment to count your blessings and do that like in a systematic way. So the ideal way is like every night and write down three to five, but nobody will do that. You will do that for two or four, or four days, but then you will stop. But realizing that you have certain things in life that are well uh, and, and very nice, it, that helps. For some people, not for others. Uh, that's one. The other one is uh, practicing optimism. Um, so trying to, and that's uh, something you can also very nicely do with your family at the dinner table, for example. So every story that someone tells, turn it around to the positive side. So even the most negative story, uh, with children, is also very funny because they, they're very annoyed in the beginning, but then they start to realize it could be a very nice game to see the silver lining to take the positive, or the longer term positive effect or the short term or the unexpected effect that was actually funny about it. And, uh, and that's something you can practice. You can get out of this like, dark view to a more like silver view. Uh, and that's harder for some than for others due to the genetic component in optimism, of course. Uh, that helps. Um, what I also always advise is take time to work for, for a couple of months, write down the things that make you happy. And then like a diary, in a diary style, mm -hmm. then go back and see, okay, th because people often don't realize, they, they think the obvious things that like going out that their friends made them happy or having dinner or whatever, 
And then when they go back, if you really write it down, oh, well, wow, I was just actually just reading a book uh, or I was actually working. And, and then they realize that it's not always the same thing that they expect make them happy or also made them happy. And that's the ideal uh, soul for making life changes, of course. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. In fact, we had a podcast guest who talked about with his team, you know, this is in the workplace. Um, he had he asked the question, it was at the end of each week, like, what would bring you joy? Like, yeah. And, and that was, and everybody in the team, and then the whole team every week would try and organize themselves in order to help sure, that yeah. individual experience, whether it was play volleyball or walk the dog or you know, whatever it was. Yeah, and it is the same in, in the workplace, also in the daily activities, you always have to realize what is your, what are your energy gainers and what are your energy drainers? And, mm. and there are always energy drainers everywhere in life, Yeah, but it should be at a certain balance. Uh, so if you have too many drainers, and many people had that during COVID, for example, because like for me, uh, as a scientist, I like meeting people. I like to travel to conferences, international uh, collaborations. Everything was reduced to Zoom. Uh, and, and then all the normal drainers were already there. So there was a lot of draining and no gaining. And well, that was good to realize. Well, other yeah. people, and I also realized that I actually. And so, what was the positive uh, yeah. about your, uh, <laughs> your your drain heavy situation? <laughs> well, I was <sighs> being at home with my family that many hours was actually new to me that it would be a gainer instead of a trainer. So I learned a lot <laughs> about my own family life. Uh, so it's it's good to realize what what makes you happy and also in unexpected circumstances uh, that's of course a better learning experience than your daily life but still yeah and and very important is that you uh realize that you can stop certain things so uh there's like for example a very easy one is this big push uh, i think for healthy reasoning a good push to exercise so a lot of people go running and they do that and 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 they actually hate it the good thing is that exercise is good from a physiological perspective. It's good to exercise, but you could also exercise in another way than running. Right. So you should realize at some point, every time when you go running, when you feel terrible, stop running, try to find something else that makes you happy, but still gets the same physiological intensity. Um, and that's, and, but then saying to all your running mates, I hate running that that's the hard part, but you should do it and then find something else. Um, it, yeah, I can't it, even get my head around somebody who would run and hate running. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't get my head around if somebody would take on a voluntary activity as intense as that and whilst hating it. Like, I guess there are people alive who would tolerate that. That, 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 that happens. And, and, and another example is uh, yoga or mindfulness uh, because there's such a high expectation that it has a positive effect. Right, people and that's continue why they go doing through it. it. Yeah. Just, and and they, they hate it. And it's probably not going to give them a positive effect because it just is not something for them. But they think, oh, I have to continue. And then every week they go there, sit there for an hour or two hours. I can go there again. Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right. stopping is my other important <laughs> advice. Right. So it sounds like, there, so what we're talking about here is there are environmental factors, you know, safety, social connection, but there are also habits that at least for some people depending on your genetics <laughs> may may uh may be worth experimenting with at the very yeah. least right because there's a reasonable sure. chance it's going to improve your well-being yeah 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 um that's stopping gratitude um and then working yeah. out your drainers and 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 yeah. and gainers and, and, and then you <laughs> Adjusting your balance accordingly. Yeah, and the optimistic view on life. That's the, 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 that's the most fun one to train. Oh, of course. Yeah, they're flipping the stories. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess you can do that with others, but then it must be slightly hard, I'm guessing slightly harder to do it for yourself, like catching yourself in a negative story. Uh, yeah, how do, how do people kind of go about taking it on for themselves? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's more or less a matter of, of practicing it and and that's easier for some people than for others to 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 be able at the that particular moment or later in in a, after the moment to realize okay what's the optimistic part of this 
Mm -hmm. uh, did I met some new people? For example, when you when your car breaks down, you have a very important meeting, and 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 the world feels like it, it all is a disaster. It's raining, and you can't get there. You you miss your promotion or your salary increase or whatever. But then you have to go somewhere, or you have to call a cab. But maybe you meet a very nice cab driver that tells you a story about a country that you don't know of. Uh, you have to uh, get food somewhere you never had that kind of food because you were in a neighborhood you would never go to so you can really in the tiny things there could be new experiences that could be positive and of course there are things happen in life that do not have any positive or optimistic part in it that also happens but most of the daily hassles that feel very negative in the end also have something positive right and as you're speaking about the, these habits and these practices I mean, we've had you know, sort of spiritual adepts on this show and it, it, yeah, to what extent, you know, where are you looking um, for inspiration and like resources to help, you know, to help you understand what might work? Yeah, what we, what we actually do is uh, the field of positive psychology is, is relatively big, uh, is a big research field, uh, but they, there is a very common research practice and that is taking two groups of people and give one group uh, an environmental exposure or a certain training or whatever and the other group not and there are many interventions and that's an approach that looks at differences between groups at mean levels we always look at individual differences so we often take if there's like a positive finding we take that particular uh, intervention say okay if we put that in an individual differences design so in a twin design for example Okay, we find differences between people and we quantify uh, how much of the differences is, is accounted for by teens, how much by the environment. Um, in the end, but that project didn't start yet, is to try to uh, do interventions in twins and to see what kind of interventions work for whom. So you have identical twins, for example, then you expect that the same intervention works. If the, the same intervention doesn't work, then it's unclear for whom the intervention works. If it does work for the two twins, but not for others, you can say, okay, what are the other differences between this twin pair and the other people in the group? So you can get at some point to a more personalized strategy. And that's what you like. You would actually like to have, for example, a, a mobile phone app with all kinds of positive psychology interventions and you, that you can build with building blocks. Say, okay, A is something for me and B, I don't like C, I take D and I take F, for example. and then. You get your own package. Uh, and mm. after experimenting, your phone gives you feedback and say, well, you picked A and B and not C. Well, I would also drop B because I don't see any change in your well-being by B, for example. Mm. That, that would be the future. But then we yeah. need a better understanding still of the individual differences. Right, right. That, yeah, that makes sense on the research front, I guess. But what I'm thinking is, as you talk, is that these, these habits – occur in you know, religious traditions and spiritual traditions that go back ages. So I'm just wondering how often you're like, well, hang on, you know, this is in the Bible or this is in the Vedas or this, this is part of this spiritual you know, tradition. Like how much do you see those connections as you're working through the, through the research? Yeah, not that much, actually. I think uh, in the end, uh, we, we, well, first to be uh, clear, we, we didn't look at, at different kinds of, of religious in detail so uh, right. but uh, we have a population sample uh, and we work with other collaborators with population samples so we have them all in the mix uh, but it's not something we specifically look at but you see that everybody looks for things like connection um, so it doesn't really matter it's for us it's more important what they mean by connection um, so a simple study but it sounds simple but it's very important that we uh, ask people to rate uh, their connections, the people they see in one week, how important this is and how frequently they saw them. We also give them Bluetooth beacons to ob objectively assess how often they saw them. And, and mm. we see that it's not the same measure. So right. the, the objective first and, and subjective assessments are not the same. And as soon as we quantify that, we can use that. And we can, uh, and on the other end, it only matters what people feel in you. So, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. But for if you want to make change in a company, it, it, it really starts by asking people and not trying to quantify from top down or based on numbers. Right, right, right. And I, the other question that comes to mind now is, is the, the kind of meta faction, right? Like, so if we want to individual, intervene on an individual, we can, we, look at, we can look at what makes them sad and how can we address that? Or we can look at what already make, is, is making them happy and we can try to give them more of that. Like, has anybody tried to look across the piece and understand which is a more successful strategy? <laughs> Trying to help people deal with what makes them sad or increase what makes them happy. Oh, it's it's very important what you say because um, um, often it's thought that things that make people sad, if if that's absent, people are happy. But that's that's not the case. Our research shows that, like we call that the environmental correlation. So the correlation between the factors that make people sad, or in our case, uh, uh, develop depressive symptoms or make them happy, is very low. So it's different environmental factors. Right. Uh, but traditionally speaking, um, when you look in the field of psychiatry, uh, the tradition is to take away the things that make people feel bad. The focus on the positive side is is relatively absent. Um, so there there is there there is some some work, but not very uh, systematic. Uh, that they say, well, one negative uh, effect uh, has like the double effect of one positive. So you need more positives to to balance right. out. Right. Uh, but I don't think the science is strong enough to make that claim, uh, uh, especially not when you put again the individual differences in the mix. Uh, because so that, what is right. positive For to me is maybe not yeah. positive to you. And perhaps yeah. even the weighting is different, even exactly. if there were a weighting, right? That across yeah. a population. Yeah. It might differ by individual. Yeah. And that, that is what we, what we try to sort out. So in, in big sets of environmental factors, we try to weight them like relatively to each other. And then the next step is to weight them for each individual. Uh, same with, with the genotype. We have different genotypes. We, we want to know what genes are important for well-being. And then we want to link that to your genotype and see, okay, what variants do you have? So how important is the positive effect of this particular gene for you? Do you have that particular variant of the gene or not? So it's a two-level approach. Right, right. Um, uh, yeah, and we, it, it's interesting that, that, we, that we're early in, in this understanding. And, and something else I was just reflecting you as we came on is like my, my tendency is to kind of want to make a bit of fun of this topic. I'm sorry, just to own it, but it's like, <laughs> And I think that's being driven by this, like this kind of taboo or nervousness or like, yeah, but isn't it all a bit la la and w- w- why, yeah. you know, why, why focus or, you know, on, on trying to make ourselves happy and it all feels a bit California. It's like, there's this kind of, I don't know, you know, cultural um, tendency to be dismissive of this stuff. And, and I just wonder if you've looked yeah. at like why that is, well, maybe if, if, if you think that's true and if so, you know, why that exists. Yeah, I think, it, well, first of all, I think we never realized how important it was. So, uh, for example, if you look at the World Health Organization in there, historically speaking, they were talking about diseases and overcoming diseases. They changed at some point and say, okay, we're, we're talking about well-being. So they, we, we were the ten, and and then in the research field, of course, it's it it feels better, and I think it's also very important to solve problems in a society. Mm. And that in history, we we thought that if we solve problems, then everything is fine. So if everything is normal, it's fine. Now we realize that if people feel well, that they function better, they have stronger social connections, they live healthier lives. Not in a one-way road, so it's, it's, it's also the other way around. But for society, it's essential, not that people feel normal, but that they actually feel well. Uh, so also in, in companies, now we start to realize that actually your employees is your most important factor of the company. It's not what you produce. It's not what you earn or what you do. It's the people. Uh, so you look now, in, I think in every, especially also European country, look at the airports. They never wanted to pay people to work there. And now everything stops. It's a big mess because we never cared about the people. Mm. 
Um, so there, there are a couple of colleagues from me for, uh, in the US who can actually quantify for a company what it means if you increase the well-being of your employees, what it means finally for the company. So I think it's part of it is that we never realize. Part of it's also that we, in large parts of the world, uh, have uh, healthy economic situations. So we have the room and chance to talk about well-being. If there's like if there's a, a bad economy, if there's war, if there's corruption, well-being it's, it's more surviving and not well-being. Um, mm. Well, that's yeah. That may be a, yeah. As you said, that might be quite an important historical factor. Is that maybe it's only relatively recent in human history that we've got very large populations who are you know relatively materially comfortable. And exactly, so this yeah. becomes that there's space to ask this question. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that would that would make a lot of sense. Uh, and, and perhaps where it's existed in pockets, you know, and I do get, I come back to sort of s- spiritual communities where I think, you know, these practices of, of, of gratitude and mindfulness and, um, you know, positive positivity, you know, in terms of like looking for the positive and negative experiences, all of those are, have kind of spiritual lineages, I would suggest, as ideas. And, but they would have been kind of isolated sort of subcultures, right, in wider societies. It, it, it feels yeah. like this is now becoming uh, more mainstream. And, more mainstream, yeah. And, 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 sort of end, up, and looked at through a Western scientific lens as well. Sure, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, if you indeed go back to the old philosophers, that happiness was one of the most important factors they wrote about. So it's it's not that that we didn't realize. And then the fun thing is sometimes people say, yeah, I never talk about happiness. And I said, well, well, maybe you should start talking about it. We talk about all kinds of things and we never, well, we ask people, uh, do you feel well? And then people say yes. And then you continue to another topic. But it would be, it is a very nice way of spending a night with friends talking about the meaning of happiness to them. Uh, and mm. it also helps your own mind to see, okay, what, what do I think about my happiness? Um, so actually, it's, it's, it's strange that we don't talk about it that much and that we see it as a, sometimes as a funny thing, sometimes, uh, like you say, like a Walt Disney-like happy peppy, but uh, there's more to it than that. Yeah, there's a great deal more to it. And, and as you say that, yeah, we sort of pretend to ask people to talk about happiness, don't we? We say, like, how are you? But we don't really... Yeah. <laughs> Not really asking how are you, right? It's just a, no. it's you know, it's sort of meaningless way of starting sure. a conversation, right? Yeah, because yeah. That, yeah, nobody ever wants to say anything other than fine or well, thank you, right? Exactly. Like, well, and then when it and when people don't feel well, we realize, so we talk about that, we help people. Mm. But when people feel well, we we accept it as okay. That's the way it is. Well, we maybe could learn a lot from someone who is who's feeling well uh, and and created his or yeah. her life uh, and and be very happy. Oh, Maker, you're feeling well. Like, tell me, you know, tell me the top three things <laughs> contributing to your wellness today, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it sounds funny because it would be absurd, but actually, yeah, but actually it'd be a really <laughs> interesting thing to ask, right? Yeah, yeah. And if we were doing that more in our life, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that. That that does make sense, um, and again, uh, and and that's about the individual. Yeah, um, and I, I think it's important also to realize that it starts already very early. It's not in our educational systems to talk about uh, feeling well. It's not even to talk about your emotions. It's not part of the educational system. That's starting now, and I think that's a very good development. Uh, but also in, in school classes to, to, to learn to verbalize why you feel well and why you feel happy to be very helpful uh, on the longer term for people. Uh, because it's to realize if you verbalize something, you realize something. Uh, but uh, that's not part of our school system, especially, well, not in the Netherlands and I don't think in any other country at the moment. I'm going to take this as a personal challenge. <laughs> the next time <laughs> someone tells me they feel well. I, I'm going to ask them why. Yeah. Why, why do you feel well? <laughs> well? They will be shocked, but I think yeah, it's a, it's a good experiment. Uh... Yeah, yeah. Because you're right. We're, we're, it, it's it's still relatively uncommon, but we're less likely to ask somebody. You know, what? Why are you not feel well? First of all, we're less like certainly in the English culture. We're like very unlikely to say I'm not feeling well. Um, you know, but but then I suppose 
it, it's slightly more normal to then ask somebody, oh, well, why are you not feeling well? What's going yeah. on? But um, yeah, to ask it in the opposite direction makes a huge amount of sense. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious what happens. Well, what's your yeah. experience will be? <laughs> <laughs> So you're the president of the International Positive Psychology Association. So what's what's the work of that association? And like, yeah, what what's the big sort of project there? I'm interested that such an association exists. Yeah, well, well uh, the, the, the main overarching aim is to uh, support uh, rigorous scientific research and to help translate that. So it's an very interesting association uh, because it's really a combination of uh, scientists and schoolers together with people that use it in practice. Um, mm-hmm. So um, we hope, we, and and then I think it's very important for the field because uh, there's a lot of non-evidence-based, like no, maybe not to say nonsense, but non-evidence-based stuff out there that is sold for big money. Uh, and, and we try to, to explain, first of all, how complex reality is, but also that there is evidence of what works for, for whom in some cases that can be used. Um, so we, we actually uh, try to make the mostly the translation. So we have uh, big conferences uh, where scientists come and where practitioners come and where they mix uh, and and. It's two. It's a two-way road because, as a scientist, uh, I like to explore, but I also need input from the floor. What is the big question, for example, in a company? Uh, how can we investigate it instead of only throwing scientific knowledge on them? We also want to 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 get inspired by issues that are uh, there in daily life that need to be investigated. And it's actually really big. It's it's a, a couple of thousand people from all around the world. Um, so that's also fascinating to see how different cultures uh, well, uh, approach well-being in a different way. Uh, yeah. Some some uh, countries uh, at a governmental level, of course, have it very high on their agenda, uh, while other countries uh, don't have it on the agenda at all. Uh, and that's also very, there are a lot of policy policymakers at the conferences as well. Right, right. And. And I'm guessing in that position as president, you're, you're leading a team right, who organised this 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 conference, and, and presumably you've got teams as well at the university. Like, to what extent are you bringing this into your personal leadership, you know, of teams? And then, and then, how are you bringing in the science as, as a leader? Uh, well, various ways. I, I try to the, like the the positive, optimistic uh, viewpoint uh, always in my teams. So, uh, um, and, and that's, there's, there are easy things like uh, not only discuss the negative things that are on the agenda, also look at the positive things and also try to, in the language you use and also the written language, make it optimistic. So uh, don't talk about problems, but about challenges or opportunities. Uh, there are all various ways to communicate better in a positive way. Um, well, I combine my research with being a, 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 an optimistic person that helps, but also a very realistic. So I think we do fantastic work, uh, but at the end of the street, nobody knows who we are. So we should also be realistic that it's important, but, but the, the, the sun will come up anyway, whatever we do. Um, so uh, that also helps. Um, but Interesting, we you use to refer to the sun going up, not, not, not going down. So, yeah. no, no, that's the optimistic view. Um, and, and important, what I, especially in, in the International Positive Psychology, uh, one of my main uh, aims is to, uh, to increase diversity and inclusion. Uh, especially uh, science is, is, is not very diverse, it's not very inclusive. Um, and, and, well, that, is, that, is, that will take a while, but we should realize it's not the case. We can only make a change if we realize what's missing. So uh, that's what we try to do. And is there any research on that uh, and any linkages between well-being? Yeah, but not that I can give you the specific details on it, but uh, it, it is in, it, it's important for the, the world as a whole that we, we become more inclusive and especially that we respect the changes. Uh, so we can say we want to become inclusive by making everybody 
uh, act in the same way or be as a, as a European female say, well, uh, if you act like me, uh, hey, you can be included. But that's not that's not inclusive. We should expect actually respect all differences and try to cope with the differences um, and anticipate that they are there. And and uh, I think that that is. We often think in our own way and expect that everybody thinks in that way. And that's not the case. Mm. Simplest example that I always tell people is uh, if you read a book and you like the book, what we tend to do is go to someone and say, you should read this book. It's a very good book. That's what yeah. you do. That's what you actually should say. I really like this book. Give it a try. Because why is it a good book? I, I think it's a good book, but that is, that's a useless uh, description of the book because other people might hate it. So, uh, so it's oh, you should, should keep every like value to yourself and let others explore it. Um, yeah. Same with food. We, we were, were very uh, much saying, well, this is wonderful food. Go there. But you can say, well, give it a try, but not it's wonderful food. That That's your personal uh, um, evaluation. Mm. Yeah, I ate something. <laughs> I'm going to share with you what I thought about it. <laughs> you go and try it. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but I see your point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's something that, uh, that, that we are used to. We, we always try to convince people we should stop try to convince people we should we could convince them to try it but not convince them of something being nice or beautiful or ugly or because that but, then, was, but we but but on the flip side we want to be like great but i also want to be like grateful for the wonderful meal i had and share it and yeah and not pretend that that just because i had that so you want to be able to share it and celebrate yeah. it and not like project it onto others right that's true sounds yeah, like the that, art. that's uh, yeah that's why the, <sighs> actually people don't like to talk about i but it, actually talking about i in several in many occasions is is the better way now well, it's wonderful right. food i considered i considered it to be wonderful food yeah it uh, also gives people more room to the next day say to you well i hated it now they come they walk up to you and say oh he liked it, what I'm going to say. Yeah, like give it a try and let me know what you think. Yeah. Right. Like creating that separation, right? This is this is what I experienced and this is what I yeah. valued about it. Now I'm curious to know what you're going to experience and what yeah, you value the, about the, it. Yeah, the, the same thing about we were talking about running earlier. Every everybody that's a runner doesn't understand that people hate running. So they, mm -hmm. they, they when they see something Not from the ones who do it and hate it. <laughs> Just to make my head around. <laughs> yeah, but but <laughs> if you see someone that that well, it probably doesn't look that fit. The only thing you think as a runner, man, come on, go running. It's wonderful. Right. Yeah, that's what you think. That's what you. So it's your own projection on someone else who, well, might have various reasons for not running, and and one could be that it makes them unhappy. Uh, so that especially people that are. Uh, High in exercise or exercise a lot have a, have this like projection on everybody. Why don't you go to the gym four times a week? I love it. Mm. A lot of people think, "Whoa, that would be killing me if I go there four times a week." Uh, yeah, but I also see how that's linked to the other practice you suggested about like keeping the happiness diary or or, or beginning to identify like what makes me happy because then I start to distinguish for myself. Like what are the, the, the very specific things that make me happy, right? I start to like create a boundary around that. Yeah, uh, yeah, and and that and of, that go on. And it should of course be in, in balance with society. So uh, it, it would be a very strange world if everybody is only doing what makes him or her happy and, and ignores the rest of the world. That that's not my advice. It's but it's a balance, and so, and for well, like I said, I'm. In that sense, optimistic, but also a person that stop can stop things. So when I, I go do certain exercise and I hate it, I start it and I think I should do this, I should do it. But after a month, I think, well, I'm crazy. Why? Why would I do this? But other people continue doing it. Uh, mm. So some people need help, like coaching or to help to to 
shape their own minds about what they like or don't like. And I think a good coach is very helpful in, in learning to set your own boundaries, to learn to know what you like and prefer to do. Yeah. Which actually brings me to, to perhaps another factor in why this isn't such a prevalent you know, conversation in society is, is a potential link with selfishness. Like, is there a connotation, right? If I just focus on my happiness, and my well-being, am I being selfish? Is, is that something that's come up in your you know, research or observation? Not really, but the other way around is, is often claimed is that uh, what you see in data sets is that there's a link between voluntary work and caring for others and well-being. Um, that is often translated that we all should do voluntary work and only care about others. But that's not the case. Because people that do voluntary work, it makes them feel better. But other people are less caring. That, that's also genetic. You can see it if, if you're in a hospital or in, a, in, in any care setting. People always say, oh, she's born for for this she's born for to care for and that's that's really the case some people are more caring than other people and for a good functioning society we need everybody uh, if everybody is like optimal caring for everybody it's also we, we also need a bit of selfishness uh till a certain level um but you're not on your own in the world so you, you shouldn't ignore i think it's i think Selfishness is not the best. I think uh, if you're too much egocentric, that I think that's more problematic. Um, so it's not you can think about yourself, but you should not always put yourself in the center of things. That that's a different uh, problem. So, so you're saying so self so it's 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 actually worse to be egocentric than than selfish. Yeah. Right. Because because then, then, then you, you only talk about yourself. You never ask someone else a question. You want the world to do well, turn in your way. While selfishness is more that you make a choice that sometimes benefits you instead of others. That's not always bad. It shouldn't be like only doing that. But sometimes it's good to make a choice that's actually in benefit of yourself at that particular moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I hear that a lot from, from mothers, right? Uh, I think especially like they, they feel that tension perhaps more than most when it comes to well-being. Yeah. in my experience, not sure. of course I've ever been a mother, but that, uh, you know, they find a tension between like putting their well-being first and, and, and a feeling of, oh, maybe that's me being selfish. Is that something you've encountered? Or? Well, I'm a mother of four, so <laughs> I have a bit of experience on that side, but, uh, yeah, I think I, I, there's a for there's a, a gender difference. That's for sure. That's also what data show. Um, and it's also what happened in the pandemic. Uh, one of the groups that is uh, hit hard, except also for of course people uh, in harder circumstances, but it's also females and also highly educated females. Because what happened? Schools closed. You have two partners that both have an important or full time job. Children's school and and in most households, not in mine, but in most households, the females were responsible because the male just closed the door and said, "Well, I'm 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 in my room. I'm I'm in a call, in a call. Don't don't bother me." While the mother thought, oh, "But I have a call also, but also the children and and so that that is indeed a difference and and uh, making the choice to do something that benefits your own well being is on the long term. Uh, maybe a good choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it's going to be down to the individual. True. Yeah. So yeah. some people need more like me time than other people. Um, yeah. And it depends, of course, on the partner as well, uh, how, uh, what the availability is. It, yeah. it depends on socioeconomic sta uh, status factors, of course. Uh, yeah. And, and some people, the, the more <laughs> the more time they spend carrying, the happier they're going to be, right? From, from if they've got that genetic set, that yeah, 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 no, that, yeah. That makes that makes so much sense. Um, fantastic. Well, is there anything we haven't covered on this topic of well-being? It feels like I've been very enlightened. I hope uh, my audience <laughs> have as well. Yeah, <laughs> no, not, not really. On? No, no. I think uh, I hope that everybody realizes that everybody's different. That I think that's mm. the most important message, uh, and and that well-being is not different than anything else that you can assess in a human being. And you can also train it. It's the same with exercise. You can 
you can everybody can train and everybody becomes a bit better but some people get way better than others if you play soccer or tennis or running marathons whatever same for well-being it's trainable and some people will have a big increase in their level of well-being and other only tiny steps it's uh, it's not different yeah thank you all right um thank you well, once again, so and if it, this the the association, especially, can can individuals join up to that, or is it just tends to be organisations? How does that work? Uh, no, it's mainly uh, individual based, but sometimes also organisations or like the HR uh, chef of an organisation, or uh, mm. yeah, there are various ways of uh, being part of the uh, IPA. IPA, okay, yeah, right. <laughs> well, uh, and uh well we can put a, we can put a link to the website in the in the show description yeah um, nice and um i guess if they're interested in vu amsterdam and the courses that people can go study you know yeah and uh, at, at the university yeah, yeah. also yeah. we'll put links to that there as well go. they can always google me and they will find me it's easy easy name to find on google yeah all right. Well, thanks once again. This has been an awesome conversation. I've really appreciated the, your time this evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you.